Hello, XJW Bible Bites. Thaddeus here. Uh, this is going to be a part two of Witnessing to Witnesses based on the response that I received to the last video. I was putting this together today. Uh, I thought it'd be good to go over the gospel according to scripture for the purpose of witnessing to witnesses in order to use scriptures directly and to avoid locking down a witness with doctrinal matters or any other subject that's just going to get them to shut down immediately, like direct criticisms of the organization, um, accusations of perfectly true things related to court cases and CSA and human rights abuses, uh, all of that stuff. That one of three things is going to happen if you pursue that path. You're going to get shut down and they're going to leave. It's going to turn into an argument that just turns contentious and goes nowhere. Or maybe you'll already meet a witness that's uh, awake, who's a PIMO. Those are the three things that are going to happen. So you might sow a seed that gets them to check out things later, but it's not, or at least I don't feel it to be the ideal way to go about trying to witness to a witness. So how do we witness to witnesses? Well, witnesses are trained, or at least we were, to find common ground with the people that we're supposed to speak to in the ministry. So at least in our congregation, there's a lot of focus on the ministry and avoiding religious doctrinal ideas or contentious things, whether political, religious, economic, anything, that we're going to end up with an argument with a householder or being shut down. It doesn't matter how much you may believe in something. This witnessing to witnesses is not about you, your ego, or your ideas. This is about them and about bringing them to Jesus Christ. So if we have to bite our tongues to get the very simple point given in the scriptures of the hope in Jesus Christ across to indoctrinated cult members, whether they're witnesses or otherwise, then just do it, okay? We live in a divided, contentious world. Contention is a work of the flesh. Note the words recorded in Acts 15, 28 through 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no further burden except these necessary things. You must abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from consuming blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Uh, that's, of course, the Apostle Paul, um, I believe. Jesus was not religious. Jesus came to break the yokes and burdens placed upon the people by the religious institutions of the day. Reference Luke 4.18 and Isaiah 10.27. It is more important to the kingdom of heaven that men and women accept Jesus and be saved than to have all doctrinal details correct. Avoid getting caught up in unimportant things. Such details include anything that the Bible does not apply to salvation, not your religion, not your pastor, the Bible. Some doctrines are salvation issues, others are not. What this means, if you do not believe in a salvation issue, it affects your salvation. But if you differ in opinion than someone else on a non-salvation issue, it does not affect either person's salvation. God does not want a bunch of Pharisees straining out gnats like eating pork, or owning a cross, or keeping the Sabbath, or celebrating birthdays, and going and gulping down camels by making a place for the devil through resentment and contentions, which lead to divisions and sects of Christianity. We will all answer to God for ourselves someday. So we are going to do a scriptural breakdown of salvation issues by the words of the Bible. Anything that falls outside of what the Bible directly and clearly states about our salvation hope is a non-salvation issue. In witness culture, it is actually expected to be uniform, unified, and pasteurized in all things, or homogenized, even though this is impossible with mankind. This is a religious idea, the ultimate hive-minded collectivist philosophy in all things. But there is a difference between the core and the details. 
In the Watchtower Society, if you disagree with the governing body, you are technically a JW apostate. Their governing body can be free to contradict their own Watchtower, contradict other governing body members, and contradict themselves in their own talks, but you are not, as a witness. Uh, as Garrett Loesch directly stated on video, on the broadcast, that the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible but they expect to be treated as such, claiming to be a channel of spirits. They claim on video and in text to be God's only channel, and yet Jackson testified under oath on video before the Australian Commission that they were to say that they were God's only channel would be quite presumptuous. Links in the description. Timothy 3, 14-16 but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Um, apparently I got the old timey translation on that. The translations I usually use are the Berean study or literal, Young's literal, um, New Living or English Standard for most things, but I'm not, I usually have a page open with like a hundred different translations of the Bible, and some are just better at conveying the ideas of the verse than others, but I usually use um, one of the Berean Bibles, Young's, English Standard, or uh, New Living. <clears throat> So what is required for salvation? What are the salvation issues as Christians under the new covenant as members of the body of Christ? <clears throat> Number one, you must believe that God exists, first of all. Hebrews 11:6. and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Psalms 14, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Ephesians 1, 15-23 For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, or elect, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So if you do not believe in God, then by extension you don't believe in the scriptures, and there's no point to believing in Jesus. Oh, number two, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, whom his Father sent forth into the world. Proverbs 30, verse 4, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his hands? Who has bound up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is the name of his Son? Surely you know. John 3.16 For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone believing in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. John 6, verse 40 For this is the will of my Father, that everyone beholding the Son and believing in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And John 7.3 now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Or 17.3, sorry. <clears throat> 1 John 4, 14-15 And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. 1 John 5, verse 5. Now who is the one overcoming the world, except the one believing that Jesus is the Son of God? And 1 John 5, verse 10. Whosoever believes in the Son of God has his testimony within him. Whoever does not believe that God has made him out to be a liar, because he has not believed in that testimony that God has given about his Son. Philippians 2, 1 through 6. Therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, 
then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others to be more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance, or fashion, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So here we see that a son of God was humble enough to set this example as compared to uh, Hillel or Lucifer, who sought to raise his throne above the stars of God, who himself thought that he could grasp at being equal with God. <clears throat> we read this in Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. By contrast, Jesus, although he was rich, took the position of a slave and diminished himself to walk as a man, to be put to death for our sake. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, there is nothing in the scriptures that lead us to believing Joseph's family was poor. Quite the opposite. But no material assets that he had in his household could possibly compare to Jesus' existence in heaven. Number three, you must believe that Jesus died for your sins and the sins of mankind. 1 Corinthians 15, 2-3 By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And 1 Corinthians 15.45 So it is written, The first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam... Jesus, a life-giving spirit. Through Adam, sin entered into the world of mankind, and death through sin. John 4, 42. They said to the woman, We now believe not only because of your words, we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man is truly the Savior of the world. Luke 2, 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good news to you of great joy, which will be to all the people. Jesus came as a savior of mankind to reclaim all of the nations to the kingdom of God. Psalm 2.8 Mankind or the nations were separated from God in the fall and again at the Tower of Babel. They were handed over to other gods or Elohim. Psalm 82 God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said... You are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like mortals, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Jesus paid the ransom price to reclaim all of mankind from sin and death. All right, number four, I think. You must believe that on the third day, Father God raised Jesus from the dead, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dead, is alive forevermore. Romans 10.9 If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart 
that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 8.11 But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6.14 Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Acts 2, 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And Acts 3, 15. But put to the death, or but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. 1 Peter 3.19 After being made alive, he, Jesus, went and made proclamation or ministered to the imprisoned spirits who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In the ark, a few people, only eight souls, were saved through the water. Revelation 1. 17 through 18. When I saw him, the Son of Man, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, now I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. These key points can be verified through scriptures across multiple translations. They are very clear. What are some doctrinal details that are not directly stated or in unaltered or out of context scripture? Well, they're religious ideals, but here are things that are never, ever, ever listed as being requirements of salvation. So these are not the salvation issues because they are not stated in the Bible. So number one, what is not a salvation issue? I must believe that Jesus Christ is Almighty God. I know that many Trinitarians seek to educate witnesses on the deity of Christ. However, I would give a gentle reminder that there is no such directive found anywhere in the Bible. There is no verse that says, go forth and make disciples by preaching the news that Jesus Christ is Almighty God and must be recognized as the supreme deity who is also himself God with two other parts of a triad God. There is no such verse anywhere in the Bible. So regardless of if one believes this doctrine truly in their heart and believes it to be correct, there is no instruction to go and evangelize it. With witnesses, one of two things will happen. You'll get shut down or you'll suffer a bombardment of counter scriptures and go round and round in frustration. I'm just giving you fair notice about how it's going to go. If you truly feel the need to bring up this doctrine with a witness, do it later. Number two, I must believe what's not for salvation. I must believe that Jesus died upon a cross specifically. This is the instrument of Jesus' execution is a non-essential detail and irrelevant to witnessing to a witness. Personally, for historical and biblical reasons, I do believe it was a cross, but this is not important to salvation. Number three, it is not required for salvation to believe that God died for three days and resurrected himself. It is not required for salvation to believe that Jesus raised himself from the dead. Every verse speaking of Jesus being raised says, the Father raised him. So when Jesus made the claim that in three days he would rebuild the temple, speaking symbolically of his own body, he was speaking figuratively. We know this because it is affirmed in context by every single biblical reference to the resurrection of Christ, that it was God slash the Father who raised him. Let's read 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Keep this commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only almighty God, 
the king of those being called kings, and the Lord over all lords. He alone can never die, and lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has seen him, or ever will. Number four, I think. There is no directive in scripture to say that you must believe in such statements as, God is made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These expressions do not occur anywhere in the Bible, or any Apocrypha, or any such text I'm aware of, and as a command to believe, they occur zero times in the Bible. The only such references you might find are direct edits and alterations that are well known even to mainstream Bible scholars that occur between the 14th and 16th century. One example would be the uh, altering or direct editing of 1 John 5-7, which you can Google for yourself. You can Google uh, 1 John 5-7 fabrication or fraud. Number five, there is nothing in the Bible that says you must have manifested the gift of tongues to go to heaven. No such statement exists, nor would it be fair to those who died before their time without such a manifestation. Number six, there is no statement in the Bible that you must be circumcised to be saved. And when I say circumcised, I mean anything of such a nature that goes above and beyond direct scriptural statements, like not eating meat on Friday, or abstaining from pork entirely. Use discernment to recognize unimportant details. There are many things religions forbid, such as alcohol or caffeine, but we are not the masters of other people's faith. There is no salvation under legalisms. There is only condemnation under legalisms. We can, uh, it's like, well, we can't eat pork. What about turkey bacon? Well, no, it's it's bacon, so it's still it, it's you know it's still forbidden because it's called. It. These are the this is the kind of ridiculous things where you get a compounding growth of laws when humans start adding their own opinions as doctrine. Christ came to do away with the legalistic system of man. Number seven, there is nothing in the Bible that says we must achieve salvation through works. Righteous works follow because we are born again in Christ. Works accompanying uh, or accompany a Christian naturally when we are saved. Works do not work out our salvation. Works go hand in hand with being members of the body of Christ. Witnesses are a religion where works are through basically how they manifest their salvation. Even if they don't directly preach this or believe this, it's how they perform it in action. And they abuse the scripture of saying faith without works is dead, dragging it well out of context. The org needs works for tax and charity status reasons and for recruitment and to keep members busy and exhausted. But natural Christians' works go hand in hand with the faith, but are not the source of salvation. The grace is. Number eight. There is nothing in the Bible that says you must be a part of or believe in some kind of God-directed corporation and listen to appointed men who have made a claim that is not stated in the Bible, made a claim that Jesus appointed them as speaking for himself or for God. Now keep in mind that witnesses have edited their version of the Bible to fit their doctrine, as religions do, of a faithful slave. They always ignore the same part of the parable, a parable which is a story meant to tell a point, that speaks of an abusive and wicked slave. Witnesses love to refer to Matthew 24 to support their apocalyptic beliefs in their preaching work, but they ignore key verses found in 4, 10, 11, and 22 through 31. A careful reading and meditation of these verses in Matthew will show why witness beliefs are untenable. Where does the Bible speak of an invisible coming of Christ? Actually, let's just go ahead and read those verses. I think it would be best. So, Matthew 24, and hang on, my window just decided to do something. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 4. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in the basis of my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and deceive many. 
uh, verse 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Uh, 22 through 31. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even into the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So again, that's Matthew 24, verses 4, 10, 11, 22 uh, through 31. And a special focus on 26 and 28. And 30 and 31. It's very interesting to me, the witnesses love to use Matthew 24 to justify their beliefs and yet ignore so much of Matthew such as their doctrine of the invisible return or Christ's presence in 1914 when he came and he apparently in 1919 again show me the scriptures when he judged the Bible students not the Jehovah's Witnesses that they were among all the organizations on the entire planet they're the only ones doing his will okay well where's the Bible talk about a third coming if that was the second coming where's the third coming there's only one additional coming found in the Bible. Oh, and no matter the fact that the Bible students at that time, I'm pretty sure they celebrated Christmas, they allowed tobacco, and they celebrated birthdays, and they did not practice the excommunication or shunning and disfellowshipping policy, FYI. So there is no scripture backing any claim on a Jesus-appointed mediator between himself and the rest of mankind. The Bible says that there is one one mediator between God and between mankind, 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and the 144,000? Eight men in New York? No, mankind. The man, Christ and Jesus himself, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So in witnessing to a witness, read 1 Timothy 2.5 and ask if they agree, which of course they most likely innocently will. Then refer to the Watchtower, 1989, 8, 15, page 30, and the Insight, volume 2, page 362, subheadings, for those for whom Christ is mediator and blessings to mankind in general. I posted both of these links in the description. The mental gymnastics that they put themselves, for me, how to know if something is biblical doctrine or not, how much mental gymnastics is required. So Watchtower denies the rank and file, the covenant membership in Christ based on three or four obscure verses to a likely symbolic number of 144,000 only found in the book of Revelation. Nothing about such a caste system or about the 144,000 is ever mentioned outside of Revelation. Jesus never mentioned it in his earthly ministry, neither did the apostles in any letters of their congregations. The Bible says that Christ is the mediator for mankind to God the Father, and that we have one hope, one calling. Ephesians 4.4 4 says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. One hope, not two. Revelation 7, 9, and 11 shows where the great crowd is. They are standing before the Lamb. No mental gymnastics are required to understand these statements. Jeremiah 7, 5-8 The Lord says, Cursed is the man 
who puts his trust in mortal hand, man and turns his heart away from God. He is like a stunted shrub in the desert with no hope for the future. He lives on a salt-encrusted plain in the barren wilderness. Good times pass him by forever. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and has made the Lord his hope and confidence. He is like a tree planted along the riverbank with its roots reaching deep into the water. A tree not bothered by the heat nor worried by long months of drought. Its leaves stay green and it goes right on producing all of its luscious fruit. Again, this is another passage in the Bible where it is so clear you don't put your trust in men. You don't push, put your trust in princes of men. And there is nothing in the Bible that says put your trust in eight men in New York who are self-proclaimed that Christ appointed men or a governing body in 1919. Show me the verse. Show me the application in scripture. And it's it's just very clear, especially being outside. And for me, coming out of witnesses, it's amazing what you can get out of the Bible when you take away religious filters. How much has been missed out of it. But I hope this was helpful is we went over what are not salvation issues because they are simply not stated to be in scripture and what are the key salvation issues when it comes to witnessing to witnesses. So I don't know when or if ever they're going to go back to public witnessing because of people, whether ex-witnesses or not, doing car crashes and King of Hill crashes and essentially people wisening up to the Watchtower's Gate even if witnesses are not. So I don't know if they're ever going to go back to their public witnessing or if they're going to go back on lockdown again for obvious reasons. But if you get letters, if you start being a pen pal, so to speak, with a witness, if you get a phone call, I hope this is beneficial and I will be posting um, in the description below, there are links, and I'm going to be putting um, the key reference scriptures into a comment pinned to the video. So I hope this was helpful and that you all have a good night, and we'll see you next time.